Today's topic is film scheduling secrets. We're going to get into my secrets in a minute, but first I'm going to read the second half of the chapter in my book called On the Clock. On the Clock. But I'm going to only read the second half because it's a pretty long chapter. All right. If you've worked on a film set, you know how important it is to remain on schedule. The art of scheduling a movie accurately is really one of the most important parts of the filmmaking process. In order to schedule a movie, clear communication needs to take place between the crew and cast who will shape it. Some DPs will want to spend hours lighting that shot, while some actors want another hour to prep for the scene. When that happens, you're soon to be behind schedule. The first thing I do is limit the DP setup time. If he or she has truly given it some thought, there will be an easy way to light nearly any scene in less than 15 to 30 minutes on any given budget. But it takes the self-discipline to be able to sit down and plan it. If you wait to decide, if you wait to decide what to do until you show up on the set, you won't know what you're doing until you get there. In that case, you will not be prepared, and it could take a long time before the camera team is ready to get the shot. Additionally, if the DP has an amazing idea for a shot that requires a long setup time, communicate about it, communicate about it during the scheduling process, and you can mutually agree on a setup time to put into the master plan. Another thing I do whenever possible is tell my actors to show up makeup and hair ready. In some cases, I have hired a makeup person, a makeup and hair person, uh, but I tell them to oversee their own schedule. And if Hillary needs to be camera ready at 3 p.m., she should be on set at 3 p.m. It is the responsibility of the makeup artist and Hillary to make sure this happens. I understand <clears throat> that everyone wants to look his or her best, whether it's in front of or behind the camera. The DP wants the best lighting, the actors want to look their best, the props, costumes, all of it. Each person wants to achieve their best. I think that's great. When I'm directing something, I want it to be the best possible experience for the viewer. So I totally understand everyone wanting to be and do his or her best. What I do not understand is how few people are really willing to take responsibility for themselves to make sure they achieve their goals. I sketch storyboards before showing up on the set. There is no reason the DP can't look at them and design his lighting plan in advance. There is no reason the actors can't look at those plans and know which side of their face will be seen. I made my storyboards available to the cast and crew of Firecracker, and I believe only about four people out of 42 looked at them. Karen Black was one of them. She loved my attention to detail. There was only one moment while we were filming Karen while we were filming, Karen voiced her opinion that she didn't like where I was putting the camera. I simply told her that now wasn't the time for that discussion. The time for conversation was all those weeks earlier when we were, went through each storyboard together. Since I filmed Firecracker, I've never had an unorganized shooting day and I've never been behind schedule. Even if I've experienced a scene running over the pre-planned time, I average about an hour ahead of schedule of the scheduled wrap time each day. Yes, it is possible to make a feature film wherein you don't have to work 12 to 14 hours a day. The trick is to check vanity at the door, really communicate with clarity and focus, and work with people who love taking responsibility for themselves. <clears throat> so that's what I have to say about that. Um, now, I'm gonna, there's a lot to unpack in that because I... I don't go into too much detail. I think that each one of these chapters in this book could uh, be an entire book on its own, <laughs> really. Um, because uh, you'll notice I just casually went by, you know, master plan. I didn't bother telling you what that is. In the first part of the, this chapter, I do get into that a little bit. And if you noticed at the end in the appendix, not only do I have a template for the master plan, but I also have an example of a page from a master plan from one of my shoots that I did so that you can see sort of what it looks like. Um, now, I know, Doug, you, 
maybe had a copy of the master plan when we were shooting Elvis. Yes. Um, and what was so interesting was on the first day, I'm going to use that shoot as an example because it was one of the more recent times that I was working with other people that I hadn't yet worked with. And on the very first day, I remembered telling the, I don't know who all was present, but I'm, I'm going to say the cast and crew, but whoever it was for that specific day. And uh, I said, I will promise you all, we will never exceed a 12 hour working day because I won't be here. I, I won't work <laughs> more than 12 hours. I will leave. So I can promise you we won't exceed that. And the line producer and the production coordinator were panic stricken. <laughs> they thought, you know, you can't, you can't promise that because it'll never work. It'll blah, blah, blah. Because in their experience, most independent films can shoot 16, 17, 18 hours a day. And, and it, what I just think that's insane. Uh, why would anyone want to go through that, put anybody through that? I'm a firm believer of rest, <laughs> of a good night's sleep, of, you know, I work better the next day if I have eaten well and slept well. Um, and I have been places where, you know, I've traveled or there's jet lag or we have gone over schedule and you don't work as well the next day. And it's not so enjoyable. And there are serious safety concerns also. You know, if, if after about 10 or 11 hours, people start feeling fatigued, and, and not just actors who are performing, but also members of the crew who have to deal with heavy equipment, um, electricity, um, you know, things that could explode. You know, I mean, quite frankly, if, if though the people handling that kind of equipment and who are responsible for uh, safety are feeling fatigued, the chances of an accident, you know, go up by every 15 minutes probably. So I don't ever see the point of, you know, trying to get it all done. What's the rush? You know, why do you have to get it all done in, you know, six days instead of just adding a day or two? I mean, I understand it may cost a little bit more money, but in the long term, you know, overtime costs a lot. And if you can omit overtime and just add another shooting day, you're actually probably going to spend less. Um, than having to pay everybody overtime or, you know, should there be an accident, you know, and you have to deal with, uh, you know, liabilities and everything else. So, uh, yeah, I've never understood that, but the way to do it. Well, anyway, so going back to this shoot where I have announced this, uh, I instructed, there were two ADs and I instructed them to print my master plan on one side of the daily call sheet uh, with the, you know, the strips and everything on the other side would be sort of the industry standard way that films are scheduled and organized. And that's the, the language, if you will, of what most people are used to. They're not used to seeing something like the master plan and the master plan originated um, on out of this, this is a page from my day planner, which I know a lot of you have seen, those of you who are younger <laughs> probably don't know what this is, but uh, in the olden days, this is how people would make an appointment. <laughs> and when I got a smartphone and I tried to work the calendar, for whatever reason, my Google, my phone, my iTunes, my Apple, all of that, there's something that's not compatible. And I don't know what it is, but it never worked for me. And I thought it would take a lot more energy to figure that out than it would be just to get another book and write it down. So my schedule each week, you know, it looks like the old school way. And I like it also because I can see the whole week. <laughs> you know, yeah. and I can I can flip ahead really easily. I don't have to worry about swiping and getting lost or like, you know, finding it is easier for the way my brain processes information. So I prefer this. Now, what's interesting about this 
is that each one of these days is broken up into 15 minute increments. And because I have always operated this way, I naturally, uh, natural, uh, it just, my internal clock is set at 15 minute increments. And what I've found is most everybody else's is also, it's just, if you're not conscious of it, you're not aware of it. But what's interesting is, uh, you know, when it, when I was scheduling my first movie, I need to wrap up the story about the Elvis lives people before I go on. <laughs> so I'm going to come right back to that and say, it was about three days in when they realized that I was serious. You know, the, the line producer, uh, I think there was one day we had a seven and a half hour work day. And I said, well, we're done for the day. You know, we could bring up another scene, but if you can't get those actors here or, you know, that whatever, you, you know, we're done for the day. And they were, their minds were blown because typically that's unheard of. And, uh, but we, it was true. And it just, it took about three days before they realized that my master plan worked. And since then, the, the first and second ADs went on to other projects where the director and the production team had never heard of such a thing or a way of scheduling. And they implemented that on other shoots and reported that it was, it revolutionized their film shoots. So I know uh, it's a revolutionary process because I've seen other people put it into action and report that. But for everybody else, it's the first time you've heard about it, it seems crazy and also completely um, a, a no-brainer. So for instance, my first movie was not scheduled this way. And we did have, you know, days that exceeded 13, 14 hours. And it really bothered me. I, I didn't know that that was the case. It was my first film, I was still learning. No one, you know, said, well, you're gonna have long days. I just thought people would show up and do their job. <laughs> but that isn't always what happens. Um, so uh, on my second film, you know, I hadn't yet questioned it because I thought, oh, I guess this is how it is. And then on my second film, um, the same thing happened. And I thought, well, this is ridiculous. Um, on that particular shoot, uh, the crew were really terrible communicators amongst each other. And so it, a lot of things took a long time. Um, and I think that there was a lack of organization within the team itself. Uh, so it, it was on that shoot that it occurred to me that I had to take control of the scheduling process because the production managers, the production coordinators, the line producers were not doing an, a job that uh, uh, felt good to me. So uh, I, I was going to say they're not, they were doing a very good job, but you know, they were probably doing exactly the job they were taught to do. And, and told to do it that way. So I, I, I don't want to say that that was bad because they were probably excelling at that 100%. But the problem is it's ineffective. And I'm going to tell you why. So typically, uh, movies are scheduled in a certain way. And one way is to group uh, scenes by location so that, you know, when you go and you rent the farmhouse or the mansion you're in that location for the most limited amount of time possible so you don't have to pay extra for you know renting it for a longer period of time so uh you know if you have let's say two days at the mansion then you're going to group all the scenes from the entire film that take place at the mansion and then you're going to shoot them at all at once in the mansion totally without considering that there are other scenes that happen in the movie. Then you're going to go to the restaurant and you're going to shoot all the scenes that happen in the restaurant. Even if uh, a lot of those scenes happened before the scenes in the mansion. A lot of times you're not even shooting in the mansion in order because you might be shooting all the scenes in the bedroom at the mansion first and then go downstairs and set up and shoot all the scenes in the kitchen at the mansion 
and then go shoot all the scenes in the backyard at the mansion, even if those are totally out of order. So it begins to become a headache really quickly for, to start with. Then, I have nothing against that. I think that's great. You know, limit the locations and shooting it that way by location makes sense. It saves money. It saves time. You could rent all the locations for a month and, you know, go back and forth and back and forth. But then you're moving the production and you're, you know, dealing with a lot of wasted time and uh, things that aren't efficient by trying to get from one location to the other and back to the other and back to the other and back to the other. So on that regard, I agree with the industry <laughs> standard of, filming at the location, exhausting the location, and then moving on to the next location. Now, here's where the problem is. When a script is broken down, uh, scenes are given a page length. So if a scene takes a page and a half, uh, that scene is known as being a page and a half. And somehow, well, or if the, the scene is maybe a third of the page, it's given a two-fifths. I can't quite remember. Like the, the ratios of how they used to break it down has changed a little bit because they would break up each page into eight parts. So instead of having, you know, uh, a, uh, a fourth, you would have two eighths. And they would say that this scene was two eighths long, <laughs> two, you know, of a page. And anyway, still to this day, most productions are organizing their shoots per page number each day. And that's how they go about it. Well, some people say, uh, we'd be lucky to shoot more than six pages today. Or, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we can get in another two pages before, you know, the end of the day. And it's, Here's, here's why it doesn't make sense. Um, when you have the, the printout for the day, there are strips and each strip is, is representative of a scene. And at the end of that strip, it has a page count, two and a half, one fourth, um, one and a half, all those added up together are the amount of scenes that you typically do in that day. So the AD and the line producer and the production coordinator typically on a traditional film shoot, take all those scenes at the mansion and then divvy them up into about six or seven pages long for each day or whatever the, the, the ideal page count is for accomplishing those scenes each day. Then they allot them day one, day two, day three, and in, in that sort of way, that's how people typically break down a scene to schedule, a movie to schedule. And so then you get on the set, the call time is at 6 a.m. And, you know, people are in costume, hair and makeup, and then you finally get everything set up and you start the scene and you begin working and, and you just go down the list. The first strip is, is two and a half pages. And then you're working along, you're, you're doing it, um, you get finished with the scene, and then you set up and get ready for the next one on the list. You know, there's, there's another strip, another scene, and that has another page count. And then you go along and you realize, oh, it's six hours in, we have to break for lunch, because that's just the industry standard and some union rules, if it's a union shoot, you have to do that. And then you break for lunch, and you get back on the set, and everybody's sort of lethargic after lunch and they're sort of taking their time. So people are moving a little slower and, you know, you get ready to do, you know, pick up where you left off if you weren't quite finished with that scene and you work a little bit more and suddenly it's 3.30 in the afternoon and you've got all these other, these other three or four strips left to do. You know, how is, how is it possible that you're going to get all these strips done, you know, uh, before the end of the day? So you keep working, you keep going through it and, you know, you get through the next strip, you cross that off and there's, there's two or three more to go and you're approaching almost 6 p.m. and you've been on set all 12 hours and you still have two more strips to do. And so 
you know, you go into overtime or if you're at the mansion tomorrow, you might break and then resume the next morning at 6 a.m. to give everybody a 12 hour turnaround. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's at the end of your shoot day, if you, some of your crew or cast are in the union or if they've specified this in their contracts that they need a 12 hour turnaround, their call time cannot be any earlier than 12 hours from whatever time you wrap. So if you know you wrap at 545 just before the 12 hour mark, you, ha- you cannot call them on set before 545 the next day. Um, and that's just the way it goes. Primarily, if, if nobody has agreed to that and, and everybody is non-union, then maybe you can get away with, you know, skimping on the 12 hour turnaround. But the 12 hour turnaround is set up so that people have a chance to get home, you know, have dinner, go to bed, get a good night's rest, get up early, go to the set. Um, it's meant so that people don't go crazy. Um, but you can see how s- scheduling a, mo- a movie that way uh, isn't so effective. You know, you get to 3.30 in the afternoon and the only person who has any idea whether you're on schedule or not is the first AD because no one else knows the page count. You know, I mean, typically the costumer and the makeup artist and the actors could care less how many pages the scene is unless it's a lot of dialogue and they're concerned about, well, oh my God, I've got two pages of dialogue to do today. You know, so it's, that's that's one thing but typically no one's really all that worried about it which is how easy it is to get behind schedule because no one is paying attention to it so when it occurred to me that i needed to make my own shooting schedule for my third film i just naturally got out my book and i i looked at it you know in this way where the scene you know the pages were <laughs> i'll use this one I have a dentist appointment on February 22nd. Um, so I, I just casually said, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build my shooting schedule to look like this. And when I was doing that, it just occurred to me, oh my God, this is the problem. No one is attaching a time of day to their shooting schedules. So when I just made my master plan up, you know, and here's a template, which is in the back of my book. It looks exactly like my shooting, my daily planner that I just showed you. And I had an okay time on my third film, but I think it was my fourth film that I really realized that I personally average about an hour or an hour and a half shooting time per script page. To make it easy for this discussion, I'm just gonna say an an average of an hour shooting time per script page, okay? So for instance, if I know that uh, this this, this, uh, scene is two pages long, I know that it's gonna take about two hours to film on average. So when I'm making my schedule and I say that 6 a.m. is call time, it takes about an hour on average to have the cast and crew ready, cast and makeup and costume and hair and everything, and the crew set up and ready for the first shot so that at 7 a.m., the first scene of the day can begin shooting. And if that scene is a page and a half long, I know that's gonna take me about an hour and a half to film. So from seven to 8.30, we'll be shooting that scene. Then we're moving on to the next scene. So on the master plan, I write out at 8.30 what the next scene will be. Who's in that scene, where the scene takes place. And if that scene is an intense fight scene, that may be only half a page long, because there's more involved, I might schedule out an hour or an hour and a half to shoot that scene based on the complexity of the scene. Whereas if the scene is 
two pages long, but it's just two people sitting at a table, that we might be able to do in just an hour. It only takes about two minutes to read two pages worth of dialogue. So you've done the take, you know, action, and two minutes later, take number one is done, cut. Do a second take, it takes two more minutes. Third take, two more minutes. Well, you're still not even at 10 minutes yet. So the chances are you, you could probably get that scene done if it's just two people talking. You turn the camera around, get the other person's shot, and be done with that two-page scene within an hour. But it, maybe it's an emotional scene. And you know the, the actors have to really do a lot of stuff, and then they have to calm down in between or whatever. You might give yourself two hours if you're, if you know, I average about an hour of shooting time per page. So I might do that depending upon the, the subject of the scene. But then what I do <clears throat> is I continue scheduling that for the whole day. And this is how I break it down. This is, this is my algorithm and this is what works for me. Your shooting time per page may be different than anybody else's. Only you know how fast you can shoot a scene or how slowly you would like to shoot a scene. So when you think of your algorithm and you say, well, let's say uh, you would prefer that uh, you shoot about two hours per written page, two hours shooting time per page of the script, then you can still implement this whole concept of making your master plan just using that thought process. So call time at six, first shot at seven. The scene uh, is one page long. So you're gonna shoot that from seven to nine because you average two hours per page. And then you're gonna shoot the next scene and you're gonna count up the hours for however long many of those pages are. And so in my algorithm, because I average an hour per shooting time or an hour shooting time per page, I break it down in that way. And if there are 12 hours in a 12 hour workday, you subtract the first hour, uh, which is what it takes to get everybody ready and set up. You subtract an entire hour for lunch. Even if you've only allotted 30 minutes for lunch, the, the general rule is that it's 30 minutes from serving the last person through the line. So by the time the last person has gotten their plate of food, it's almost 25 minutes into lunch. So count on an hour. If you're shooting in the same location tomorrow and you can store the equipment, the breakdown time at the end of the day will take less than 30 minutes. If you have to move and you're gonna put everything back in the trucks and take it back to the production office and you're gonna change locations for tomorrow, it might take a little bit longer to break down. But for the sake of this discussion, let's say that the teardown at the end of the day is 30 minutes. So you have two hours and 30 minutes of non-shooting time used up every day within that 12 hour period. That leaves nine and a half filming hours and just nine and a half shooting hours. So then when you go through to make your schedule and you have separated all those scenes that take place at the mansion, you know that when you make the, the count of the page count uh, tally at the end of each scene, you also need to write down how many filming hours that scene will take. That is the first step that no one does. No one considers how long it's going to take. But if you have made more than one movie, you should be able to know what your average is for filming time per page. If you have never made a movie before, you're probably going to hire a DP who has. So he can probably help you with setting up the algorithm based on how fast he shoots. You know, how long does it take him to shoot or her to shoot a scene? They'll tell you. And then you take that information and you plop it down in a scheduled plan that looks just like a day planner and you break it up into 15 minute increments and you count up nine and a half hours worth of filming for the day. And if you've got three, three page scenes, 
and your average is an hour shooting time per page, that will probably take up your entire day because that's three hours per scene and that's nine hours. And maybe you have a couple exterior establishing shots you can just knock out in that last 30 minutes or wrap at 11 hours and 30 minutes. Typically, that's what I do. If I get to hour 10 and people are in a good mood, maybe we'll shoot something more. Maybe we'll just go home. Um, I very rarely have ever approached getting even close to 12 hours. <clears throat> and when I do, I feel so embarrassed. I'm panicked. I'm like, because I promised everybody on day one that we'll never shoot over 12 hours. So there have been days where we filmed, you know, 11 hours and 47 minutes. And, but that's rare. It's a rare exception. Now, at the end of Filmmaking Confidential, um, for those of you who are joining us later than usual, um, I just wanted to let you know that I have already read from my book and uh, I've been talking about it now for a good 35 minutes, but um, I will make this recording available on my website, the video. So if you go to stevebalderson.com, uh, go to the resources page, and we have all the videos from all of this stuff. Um, basically, what I, and so you can get caught up uh, another time from the beginning. Here is the blank uh, template that I have given in my book for anybody. And you can make this in Excel. You can make this in Word. It doesn't matter. There is no software that has this at this current time because all the movie magic scheduling software does it the way that I described in the first part, which is inefficient. They, none of them include time on the clock or the time it takes to shoot something or the time of day. It's like they, they couldn't be bothered with time, which is why every project is behind schedule, you know, over time and over budget. And if you implement this, you will never be over time, over budget and behind schedule. You will always remain on schedule. You might have to adjust the algorithm to suit your specific individual filming time because only you know what that is. For me, it's about an hour per shooting time per page. So here's the blank. Uh, at the end of my book, you know, there's a template. You can just copy it and use it. Um, and on the next page is an example from one shooting day, Thursday, September 22nd in London. And it's not in color. Uh, when I do my master plans, uh, I typically color coordinate the pages so they're easy to see. Um, the, dark, the dark gray parts are setups and, and movings, but this is sort of, if, it, if it'll focus, I don't know if it will. Um, it probably won't. Um, this is what a master plan looks like when you're done. So I have, here's the time of the clock. Every 15 minutes, it's broken down. Um, because if a scene is like an establishing shot, we can do that in less than 15 minutes. We don't need a whole half an hour for that. So that's why I, I still do break it down into 30 minutes. So we have the, the clock here, and then we have the scene number in this column. And then we have, so we have the, the clock, the scene numbers, um, the location or the, the scene name. This is a street post kidnapping and the location underneath, uh, Portland or Wardow Muse. All the names in London were very confusing because every alleyway had a name like Wardow Muse. And so we had to, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't easy to get around. And then I, I list who's in that scene in this column. Maybe there's some other special, you know, notes you put in here. So then at, you know, our, our call time was at three. We allowed 45 minutes on the London Underground to get to Wardlow Muse or whatever the hell it's called. And then so at four o'clock was when we started shooting. We shot that scene for an hour and a half. And then the next scene started at 530. And then uh, that was in a tiny alleyway uh, <laughs> near Wardow Muse. Like we just went around the corner and shot that one. Um, then we broke for a snack at 6.30 for an hour. And then we had a half an hour uh, commute to Lancaster Gate. And then there was a short scene that took a 30 minute 
uh, filming and then another one that took an hour and then 30 minutes. So on that particular day, we, we wrapped at 10 p.m. And by the time we walked to Paddington Station and circle, uh, went back to the circle line to the hotel, it took about a half an hour. Um, because that was the first day of filming, I kept the filming time light. You know, even though we were, our call time was at 3 p.m., I wanted to make sure we were wrapped and back at the hotel by 11. Um, so that people could get a good night's sleep and then, you know, get up bright and early the next day. So we only filmed one, two, three, four, five and a half hours that day. Yes. So you, you scheduled the, the move times too in here, not only just shooting, but also the actual moving. How long it was going to take to. OK. Yeah. And that's a big deal. If yeah, yeah. You, I hadn't thought about that. <clears throat> yeah. If you are having a company move in the middle of your day. Or even if you're going from upstairs at the mansion to downstairs at the mansion, that's a that's a small company move because you're still at the same place, but <clears throat> it's going to take some time to get all that stuff from the second floor to the first floor. So you should account for it. Even if it only takes 15 minutes, you should still account for it. It might take half an hour. But that way, if you're if you're just accounting for it, then you won't over schedule. And that's the trick. Yeah. If it if you're gonna move, you, if you only have one scene to do at the mansion, and two scenes to do at the restaurant, and you're gonna do them in the same day, and the restaurant is a 30 minute drive from the mansion, it's not gonna just take 30 minutes. Okay, you're gonna need to include the the tear down from the mansion, which will take 30 minutes, the 30 minute drive. And then an hour, probably, setup time at the new location. Because every, every morning, if it's your first time at that location, it will take about an hour. Mm -hmm. So it, it will take you two hours for that company move, which just ate into the allotted nine and a half filming hours. So for that day, you really only have six and a half or seven filming hours um but it, it, no big deal all you have to do is just be aware of that and know that and when you're scheduling it and working with your scheduler or the line producer or the production coordinator whoever's doing the schedule you just include it and then you know what it is and it could take two six-day weeks it could take three six-day weeks it could take four or five-day weeks who knows what it's going to be but that's the that's how you do it, and that's how you break it down. Now, <clears throat> let's say there's a really beautiful, uh, complicated shot, <clears throat> and it's going to take. And your DP is so excited; he's like, "Okay, this is going to be the most unbelievable move, the under, most unbelievable camera move in the world," and everybody's going to write about it, and everybody's going to study it for years. You know, it's like the opening of um, Touch of Evil, you know, by Orson Welles. It, it's, it's one of those that's just going to be this mind-blowing shot. And it's going to take five hours to set up. Well, you have two choices. One, if you have the resources and you're okay with that extra shooting day, or, you know, you really want to take priority and say, is that important enough to spend all that time on? Maybe you'll arrive at the answer is yes. Maybe you will vote for that. Maybe you'll say, great, let's do it. Then when you're making your master plan, you allocate five hours setup time for whatever shot that's going to be. And that's okay. No big deal. You just account for it. Now, I might say, you know, unless it's the opening of Touch of Evil, or unless I've designed the, the finale beach scene in Roma, you know, where it's just one long shot that she goes into the water and it took him all day to set up for that one chance to get it at the end of the day with the sun exactly right. I think they did it like three takes or something. Um, maybe you do do that, but it, unless it's like that, unless it's something that is that stunning and that cinematic and that beautiful, I would probably tell my DP, that's a lovely idea but I don't think we have the resources to spend five hours on that today. Or, you know, you've, you've, you're having this discussion with the DP before you're ever on set. 
This is when you're making the schedule before time. And the first part of the chapter in Filmmaking Confidential, I talk about that because I schedule a movie this way, you could eliminate the need for a first or second assistant director because typically their job is to do this on a daily basis because you know the archaic way of scheduling a movie using movie magic scheduling software is that you do it by the page count. And so of course it's 3.30 and then it's 5.45 and you're behind schedule and you've got all these scenes that you didn't get to film. So then you move them on to the next day and everything gets pushed back. And so you're making your film schedule every single day and it's gonna be different every day. What I do, because I break it down and I limit it to under the 12 hour, you know, working per day, I have printed out a whole booklet that I pass out you know, a week or two before we ever film to the entire cast and crew. And that does not change. Now, sometimes you get to a location that you're shooting outside and it's raining, or, you know, you have to make adjustments. Maybe, you know, there's a, a technical problem that lasts an extra 45 minutes to fix, you know, but you still, on average, I don't think I've ever had a point where I needed to move something from one day to the next unless you know we were just tired of that for that day and then well we're going to be here tomorrow let's just pick it up in the morning that has happened you know where we're running against the light and it's just not the right you know it's a little too dark it's just it's got just enough too dark that we should just do it in the morning um and so we've done that but essentially uh if you do this you could still have a first ad to help you organize you know get crew around, get cast around, you know, sort of as an assistant for sure, but they're not going to have much else to do. You know, my first AD on that project that we talked about at the beginning didn't understand what he had to do other than, you know, get on his walkie talkie and make sure everybody was following the master plan uh, because he was so used to making the schedule and having to deal with challenges and problems of moving things. And because he didn't have to do any of that, he was like, well, what am I doing here? <laughs> and I thought the same thing. I mean, he was great. I loved him. I loved working with him. Um, his name was Kevin. And he, uh, all, he had such a, a quiet disposition. He'd be like, okay, everybody, let's get on the set now. Everybody's going to get ready to shoot. Okay, quiet on the set, everybody. Like that's, he talked like that. Like he was it, like, always high but he wasn't actually high he just talked like that <laughs> and and that's what i loved i loved it because typically ad's are like okay everybody get on the set da, 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 da. you know they're like blowing through you know megaphones and all this stuff which is just ridiculous and kevin was like the antithesis of that um but uh you know i mean i that's why he took it on to another film set because he he saw how revolutionary it was to structure a movie this way which is I never, it never occurred to me that no one does this until most recently because I just have always attached a time of the clock, a time of day to the schedule. And that's all you have to do is, is make it up that way. And um, it, it doesn't have anything to do with page numbers. You know, everybody wants to shoot seven pages a day. Well, if your average is two hours shooting time per page, and my average is one hour shooting time per page, then we're gonna have two entirely different days if you are making all of your decisions based around the page count. So my advice is to ignore the page count or look at the page count, but only if it, and as it relates to the time on the clock and the time it will take to shoot it. Um, and you know, again, if, if you only have the resources and the funding to allow for two, six day weeks or three, six day weeks, whatever your, your financial resources have given you the, the barrier for that, um, you might need to do some rewriting in your script. If you have a longer, uh, shooting time per page, or if you've got too many scenes, you know, or if. If there's too much going on, you might say, well, I don't know how we're going to fit all this in in two weeks of filming without shooting 14 hours a day, 
which most people do. Yes, Doug. So now, do you have a number, a, a rough number of how many takes you're thinking of too, in terms of that time? Because earlier you said, you know, okay, take one is going to be two minutes, take three. Do you think in terms of, okay, I, I, it's probably going to take me six takes or, I mean, is there a number that you think, or do you just think strictly in the time concept? Both. Now I, as I am, my, the way I work is the way I work. The way that Kubrick works is on the other end of the spectrum. You know, I am a perfectionist, but I'm not, uh, I've often wondered, I don't think Kubrick was a perfectionist. I don't think Kubrick knew what he wanted. I think that he filmed without knowing what he wanted and didn't know until he saw it or didn't know until it was being edited. So that's why he did it in every way you could possibly imagine so that he could decide what he wanted later. That's just my hunch. I don't, I don't think there's any reason otherwise to film endlessly like that, like he did. You know, I know what I want before we've gotten on set. So when I see it, I move on. I might, and I often do a second take, you know, once I've got it, if it's like the third take in and I've got it and I'm ready to move on, I will do one more for fun just to make sure, you know, and typically it's never as good as the one that was the one. So then we move on. Or, and when I say good, I mean, it doesn't match what my ex, what I wanted. Um, so uh, you take that in consideration. So that's why I say I average an hour per page because I'm allotting the amount of takes that I typically do and the amount of working time that I do on the moment. But if you like to, uh, for, I also shoot my rehearsals because sometimes there's a magic that can happen in that first time out of the box. You know, the first time that actor saying those lines, it might be magic. And so I prefer to be filming when that happens so that you can capture the magic. Because if I, and every time it's so funny, like I'll say, oh, now this time, let's just wait and shoot after the rehearsal. It's always magic. Just because it's like the universe says, oh yeah, yeah, you're not going to film? Wait, just wait. <laughs> you know, And then they'll lay out the magic and then you'll never get it again. Like you take... You know, you roll the cameras, you're going to do the first take and then the second and the third, and it's never the same. And that's just the laws of the land. So that's why I always film the rehearsal. Um, so by doing that, uh, let's say you don't want to, and you want to rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it, then you're going to go and film it. And let's say you average five or six takes, then your shooting time per script page will be a different ratio than mine. Uh, but you just you just have to do some curiosity. Go inside and find out like what is your ideal filming time. And once you have that, then you can make your master plan, organizing it the way that it's good for you. All the while keeping under 12 shooting hours or 12 uh, working hours per day. And that's the easiest way to do it. Um, so did that make sense to anybody? I know that's a lot to unpack that, and I'm using terminology that sometimes people don't use. Um, I am on my cell phone, so I'm only seeing three of you at a time. And so I have to swap pages. If you have a question, just unmute yourself or hit the whatever and holler at me. And I'm sure it's great. <laughs> and I can just, I can swipe to you and then we can, we can talk about it. Um, Martin, I saw you went off mute. Do you have a question? Yeah, how often are you doing like quick math in your head where you're like cutting scenes? If it's that pressure, I can understand like if you really believe something's going to be completely beautiful and worth it, you would make the time if it was if it was feasible. But how often are you just like, okay, we don't need that? Are you just rearranging it the whole time? Or you, how does that work? Um, it depends. Sometimes when I was filming, this is there's a chapter in my book where I talk about this. Um, the scene had been written. I think it was a two and a half page scene and it was in this romantic comedy and, and the, the guy and the girl were laying on the floor playing chess 
and they were having a dialogue and the camera was like, it was like a dolly move that was slowly moving into them. And it got up to them. It's a nice, lovely two shot. And she says, check me. And it just felt like the perfect period on the end of that scene. Now in the script, it went on for another page or so. And there were some funny jokes on that page, but I knew since I was also editing the movie that that's where I was going to make the cut. I didn't need to waste the time filming the rest of that scene. So we just moved on to the next scene. Now in the master plan, I had accounted for that next hour. So on that particular day, we wrapped an hour early because we would have spent another hour filming that scene, but we didn't. We just went on to the next scene. Um, but I, I typically do that. There's, there's three times, and, and maybe we'll do a whole other talk about this, about editing. Um, because there's another chapter about editing, and then there's another chapter called Every Movie is Really Three. You know, there's the movie you write, the movie you edit, and the movie you shoot, or whatever. So it's like when I'm making the schedule, and I say, damn it, either we need the mansion for a fourth day or one of these days is going to be kind of long. And I don't want to go over 12 working hours. I don't want to. So if I don't want to, I can't ask anybody else to. I mean, that's where it comes down to. It's like, I don't want to be there after 12 hours. So I'm going to tell my gaffer, dude, we're not going to be here for more than 12 hours because I'm not going to be. So if you want to be fine, you can stay, but I'm going home. <laughs> we won't be shooting. Um, and it, you know, it's, if I, if I wanted to be, you know, working more than 12 hours a day, I probably wouldn't have a problem, you know, having a 14 hour day, but I'd have to then start considering other people's feelings, not just my own. <laughs> and not, not everybody wants to be there. It's, it may be your passion project, but it's not your gaffer's passion project. So he doesn't want to be there for 14 hours. I mean, that's just, you know, whatever. Um, it, no one else, it means as much to as it does you. <laughs> so, you know, just keep remembering that along the way too. Um, so when I'm doing the master plan, I might say, okay, what can I rearrange or change in the script to make it so that we can actually get all of this done? You know, I might say, oh, why don't we combine those two scenes at this point, there's no reason to break them apart because then we're gonna to have to go into a different room and light it differently. Let's just keep it in here. You know, I, I might do that, you know, while we're scheduling it. And then when we're on the set, do the example, like I just mentioned with the checkmate, you know, when the girl said that. Um, if there's ever a time when there's a technical problem or malfunction or, you know, we get behind during the day, I typically either somehow, magically makes up for itself uh or maybe once or twice i have had to um change some things or uh compromise something not necessarily important you know any of the important things you know i you have your list of priorities it's like what what is something that you're just not going to budge on that are like the key points of this project and then what are the ones that you really don't care you know, make that list for yourself ahead of time so that you can know, oh, where does this fall on that list? Oh, it's in my not important category. Okay, well, who cares then? Because I, it's not bothering me, you know, on my, the list of the things I really love. Um, but yeah, that, that happens all the time. Um, and I don't know if it always did, but, you know, after 17 features and I've edited most, more than half of them, I just think that way while we're shooting, um, which I think is just sort of a, a muscle that you just build. But you wanna, you'd wanna have like a, a extra stuff to edit, wouldn't you? So like when you, I like the story that when you just cut a, a checkmate, but one of those jokes could have been a voiceover or something that you were saying that was in the extra bit that you cut. Is that also in your head or a thought? Sometimes, I mean, in that particular case, I didn't think personally those jokes were funny. Everybody else did, but I didn't. <laughs> um, so I didn't feel bad about cutting them, but, uh, and the writer didn't mind either uh, when, it, when it got down to it. Um, but yeah, sometimes if you, you I, there's, there's a way to create in the, the constraints. 
So if you know that you have to accomplish X, Y, Z within this constraint, it often, for me at least, opens up a world of creativity on all the ways you can accomplish X, Y, Z. And, you know, differently than how it's written in the script. You know, it's like, uh, does the script say this? Well, what's the purpose? If you can get the purpose of the scene in an easier way or a more time efficient way and you're behind schedule, maybe you should do that. It's the same. It's fulfilling the same purpose, if that makes sense. Steve, may I ask something on that note? Yes. So on that note where we're talking like an hour per page, how would that yeah. work on an improv script? Um, it, it's still your, it, it just depends. I mean, for instance, when we were doing El Gonzo and there was, that was my first sort of improv based acting script. And we had, you know, a very structured outline and we knew all the beats and there was going to be a discussion of, and we also did this in the last winter in uh, Alchemy of the Spirit with Xander and Sarah, where there would be a topic and this scene is going to be a, Big scene, it's a heavy scene. Uh, in El Gonzo, it was about um, confronting uh, a betrayal. And it was between the two characters. And I, I knew the way that I was going to edit it together would allow for me to turn the camera on and just let them go. Yeah, so do you have like, it's you kind of have a time limit for what you see the scene taking versus going by the page? Well, yeah, think about it as a viewer. How long are you willing to watch that scene happen? Mm -hmm. So if you're filming and it's riveting and 20 minutes later, it probably won't be riveting. Mm -hmm. So if you do that take three times and you do it 15 or 20 minutes each, that's going to take an hour. And if you do you know, filming one way for an hour, three takes at 20 minutes, and then you shoot the other side, three takes at 20 minutes, you'll have, if you're working with good quality actors, you will have plenty to shoot from. In fact, you could take parts of take one, parts of take two, and parts of take three, and build a 35 or 40 minute scene based on all of those six takes, you know, this camera angle and then the other camera angle, which is sort of what I did in Algonzo a couple of times. We would just do the take and see how it went, you know, and sometimes the actor in the first one would, uh, you know, because it was sort of a confrontation betrayal scene, uh, would be very uh, uh, feisty. And he would sort of like, his character would be really, really mean. And after the scene was over, I felt like, oh, God, I hate that guy. I don't want him to do that. So I went up to him and said, okay, this time, let's play it, you know, a, a little differently. And so then we did it again. And then, you know, he was, a, he performed it differently in that time. And then we did a third one. And sometimes I'll say, okay, let's just go see what happens, you know, like, um, change it up. And we would do that. And then I would then later in the editing room, craft the scene the way that I wanted it to be put together. I mean, it's, it's essentially writing in reverse because you take the lines that they have said and totally out of order, and then you assemble them as if you've written them that way in order. Yeah, that makes I sense. What, I, it does, but I think more of what I'm asking is in terms of um, time that I would tell them it's we're gonna be working today. So more of like earlier when you were speaking that like you might take an hour to do like a page of the yeah. script but if I don't have like all that dialogue and that big page because most of it's going to be improv like right. what kind of time do you think I would tell them we're going to be working to do this scene is it just sort of I, I would assume most of it's just sort of like open to my you know intuition or whatever but is there any sort of professional tips on that well you may have come in after I said this I can't remember um but if the goal, which in some cases, if you go over a certain amount of time shooting per day, uh, whether it's you know 12 hours for union rules or SAG is like eight or something, I can't quite remember. If you get into overtime, it becomes very, very expensive. So 
what I try to do is never exceed 12 working hours. Mm -hmm. So you never exceed a 12 hour working day. And if you're going to do that, you're going to break it down this way. An hour for camera setup and call time to get the cast and costume hair and makeup. An hour for lunch. Even if you've only allocated 30 minutes lunch break, it's known that the last person through the line is when the clock starts. Yep. So, I heard you say all that just so that you know. Um, oh, okay, great. So yeah, you, do, you so you have, have okay, so you have nine and a half shooting hours every day. Right. And whatever you make up within that nine and a half shooting hours is your prerogative. Okay, so it is sort of like an open window to whatever. I was just wondering if, because where you did speak about like usually one page of a script would take one hour out of that nine hours. On an improv thing, did you know like what it typically takes or is it, I don't know if I'm getting down to the minutia here and maybe it really is just a big open thing. Um, I didn't know how professionals normally, how long out of that nine hours they take to do a scene when it's improv or is it just sort of open-ended? I don't, I don't think that it's very common for anybody professional or not to work in an improvisational manner. So I think that the rules are however it feels. When I did El Gonzo and I was talking about that betrayal scene, I think it was in the afternoon, we had had lunch at noon. I always break for lunch at lunchtime. I don't wait six hours. I like to eat at lunchtime every day. Yeah. So I think it was like one o'clock, we started the scene and I may have given either two and a half or three hours total. Um, and maybe we got it done in an hour. And then we just had all this extra free time. But I, if it's gonna be an improv scene uh, that is complicated or emotional, I kind of double my average shooting time because what my average shooting time is based on a script. So if it's improv, I will double that. Okay, that's exactly why I asked because that's what was happening in my mind. I was thinking where you're leaving it like, you're not saying this is exactly the plan, but you have it open to whatever happens. It might be better to give it more than like an hour per, for what would normally be a page. Yeah, it just depends on the subject. And it's up to you. You know, if it's something that's it's it's uh, really rich or if there's a fight or if there's, you know, um, uh, choreography involved or, you know, emotions if somebody has to cry, like those things will take time. Um, okay. If it's a if it's a conversation at a table then it's not going to take as long. Okay, thank you for answering that, because I think I was just trying to touch base with if that was actually correct for me to think or not. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, 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 of course. Well, and, and that's what I said also to everybody about your filming time, even if you have a script or not, is going to be unique to you. Some people might find it challenging to accomplish what they need in one hour filming time per page. I know that Woody Allen, who thinks very, very independently um, and has a lot of the same beliefs I do about how to run a movie set, doesn't decide what he wants to do until he walks on set. I know that, I've read his memoir, he says it <laughs> in it. He will walk on set, go up to his DP, and then they will walk around and say, oh, I don't know, what do you think we should do? And they just kind of look around and then they decide then. Now, that's an inefficient use of time, in my opinion. Um, but that's how he operates. And he's also known as doing one big master take, and that's it. He hates coverage. He hates doing a take two. He hates you know, going in for close-ups. So he'll just do a big master take and say, let's go. Um, and I love it because he wants to go home at 5 o'clock and you know, have dinner with his family also. <laughs> he doesn't want to you know, work until all hours of the night. And I respect that, I think that's great. I think, you know, if, if filmmaking and the process were enjoyable and relaxing and fun, I mean, even if it's sometimes challenging, if it's enjoyable, it's one of the greatest jobs and one of the greatest experiences I've ever known. Um, and if you're also in the field, film sets that are efficient, and take care of their people are a total joy. And the ones that aren't, you know, is it really worth it to waste those days, to waste those hours of your life? You know, I, it, it depends. If you're getting a lot of money for it, I say cough it up for two weeks. <laughs> Cash the check. 
But if you're not, then really you got to make it rewarding. And there's another chapter in my book called Make It Rewarding. And it's, it tells you how to do that too. Um, but I think that, you know, truly, I don't know, it's just, it, it, it's revolutionary. And uh, the idea to make it fun and not stressful, there's no reason to pull your hair out. There's no reason to drive people crazy. Um, and maybe, you know, I don't know, if, what's the rush? Again, I always say that. I'm like, why panic? about we've got to shoot this in less than two weeks well why why can't you just add another day or two well because it's going to cost us you know whatever it's going to cost seven hundred dollars i mean it's not even it's like you're you act like it's a you know brain surgery and it's a filming day <laughs> you know it's like it's not the end of the world um i'm actually anyway. glad you brought that up and i hope i'm not taking up too much whatever but um in that same note I've been honest with the people that are coming on the cast that this may yeah. take over, over a year to make. Is that too dramatic to say to somebody? I mean, I've, this is my first film. So um, I was very clear with them that, you know, this may take quite a, a while. Um, I'm not the person that wants to rush like that, but is that too long to tell somebody that it might take like over a year? No, you can tell them whatever you want. I think that the challenge will be to find the people who agree to that. I mean, if you're Kubrick and you're signing the two largest movie stars in the world and you tell them we're going to go indefinitely, they didn't even have a return date. Tom and Nicole agreed to do Eyes Wide Shut without a return date. And when you're the two largest movie stars in the world and you're working with Stanley Kubrick, you might just say, you got it. I am there for however long it takes. Um, I personally, even with, with my experience level, don't know anybody that would give that to me unless I was paying them. Okay, so um, maybe this is going on. If you would rather I save this for like another chat, that, uh, at another time where it's more relevant to the conversation, that's fine. But um, on that thing, um, is it wrong to have somebody sign a contract that with deferred payment and credits that they would stay through throughout the whole thing? And if that's for another time, let me know. Well, let's talk about that another time. But basically all I'm gonna say quickly about that is that it, there is judgment doesn't exist. There is no such thing as good, bad, right, or wrong. There only is what is. And it's not wrong or right to put that into the contract. You just put it into the contract because that's what is. And you, you set your, your shooting time because that's what is. What your filming time per page fits for you is what it is for you. There is no good, bad, right, or wrong. That's just is what it is. And then you then in turn uh, look at your cast and crew you present your master plan, your shooting schedule to them, you present them their contract, you present them whatever it is, and then they will either agree to it or not. And there's nothing you can do about that. If, if I go to the production company and say, here's my shooting schedule, and it's going to take us an extra week. I'm sorry, it's going to take us an extra week. They will either say, well, you're going to have to make it work with the same budget constraints. You know, if you can figure out how to make it work, we don't care how long it takes because this is the budget. And if you could do it in two weeks or four weeks or six weeks, it doesn't matter, but this is the budget. You're not going to get any more money for it. This is just what you got. Then, I, then it's my job to figure out if I can. And then if I can, well, it doesn't matter how long it takes or whether it's five days a week or six days a week, one day off a week or two days off a week. It just depends. Maybe there's no days off. When we were in... Um, El Gonzo in, in Mexico, we didn't have a day off because there were often days we finished filming at two o'clock in the afternoon and we could go to the beach. <laughs> so I thought, well, we're not going to take a whole day off. You know, there's no reason to. Every scene takes place within an hour of this hotel and most of it takes place in this hotel. We can wake up in our rooms and go down and have breakfast, walk out and shoot the scene and then go to the beach. I mean, essentially, that's what some of the days were like. It was crazy. But anyway, there's no right or wrong way to do any of this. The only thing that the biggest secret about 
film scheduling per se is using the clock, attaching a time of the day to the clock. And you pass out the master plan to everybody on the crew. On every side, they get their call sheet every day, which you, you could print up before the shoot because you're not you know, behind schedule. You put the master plan on the other side and the makeup artist looks at it at 1.30 in the afternoon. He or she can see exactly where we're supposed to be. And everybody knows if we're on schedule or not. And that's what is a really interesting thing because as I said earlier, no one is counting the hours per whatever. It's three o'clock in the afternoon and we've done three and a half pages today. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. But if you look at the master plan and you should be shooting scene 62 at 2.30 and it's three and we haven't gotten to 62 yet, you know you're behind schedule for about, you know, about a half an hour. So you better you know, figure something out. Um, but chances are you don't get behind schedule because you're looking at the clock on your watch at the same time as you're looking and checking things off the master plan. So when you're 30 minutes away from supposed to be finishing this scene, that's when the AD says to me, the director, you've got 30 more minutes left to do this scene because that's what we have scheduled. And then I figure out how to do it in 30 minutes. I mean, that's an example. So, um, and that's the secret uh, is just implementing it. You know, and if somebody does, I feel like earlier on in my life, I wanted to, you know, make the software and license this and do all this stuff. But then I thought, oh, I'm just going to give it away because it makes life better for everybody. <laughs> And if you can figure out a way to use movie magic scheduling software um, and implement the time it takes to shoot something, which then you can incorporate onto a time of the day, like none of the call sheets actually are made up with the column that allows for the time of day. I think it's silly to me, but um, that's all you gotta do. And then you will never have a film set run behind schedule or over budget again so take that <laughs> um absolutely um does anybody else have any other questions about anything we've talked about today all right well our next talk is next saturday we're going to talk about the truth about film festivals. I'm gonna tell you all about it. And if you get my book between now and then you can read about the chapter that we'll be discussing. One of my favorite articles, yeah? I do have one more question. I'm so sorry, I'm sort of being like a little hog here, but I'm trying to soak up everything that I can. So on the, you keep mentioning an assistant director, you've mentioned it several times throughout this talk. Can you have like anybody be the assistant director if you credit them in the film for that? Well, yeah, there, again, there's, there's no right, right, wrong, good or bad. So if, if there is a professionally trained assistant director, like the guy that I mentioned, who otherwise didn't have anything to do because I had already done his job for him, um, I have used anybody. I have used, in fact, there, sometimes I've used a makeup artist who has finished doing the makeup and he's got nothing else to do for the day so he can become the first AD just because I needed an assistant. Anybody can do it. Um, you get into trouble when you're doing a shoot that's a union shoot and you have to use a, a, an actual AD through the director's guild. I prefer to keep all of my crews non-union so that I don't have to deal with that because there you get into a lot of problems. But again, I want to keep that. We're, we're, I want to wrap up this talk because I, I, going into crewing and, and, and that we could go on for another half an hour. But I just... I. If anybody has any more scheduling and how to make a, a appropriate schedule and use the tips that we've used here today, or maybe you think of a new one, let me know because the more efficient and the more organized and the more prepared you can be before you ever show up on set, the better. And whether you do that in Word, or Excel, or movie magic software, or on a chalkboard, or in note cards taped together with scotch tape. However you do it, it doesn't matter as long as it's organized and 
thought out and planned and then executed per that plan. Yes, Doug. I think you mentioned, and I, you didn't say it today, but I think in the book you mentioned that the four colors of, and yes, and I remember it being like interior, exterior, day and night. Weren't those the four colors that you had? Yeah. Or something like that. that uh, Has anybody ever seen? Good thing. Yeah, to have, well, to use. Well, and, and I do, and you can't see it in the book because the book is black and white. Um, but this, like, because these are exterior scenes that actually is yellow on the master plan. Okay. Because exterior day is yellow. And then exterior night is purple. And interior night is blue. And interior day is white, typically. You could also do interior... There's no rule about this either. You could do interior day as yellow and exterior day as green. Um, and then company moves and other things could be whatever other color cards you have that you're not using. And again, they don't have to, you don't have to have, there are no rules about that. It's whatever you want. If you want day interior to be blue and day exterior to be purple, go ahead. In my mind, I picked colors that were associated with the light of the day. Mm -hmm. So I, I commonly think that nighttime is blue because it's dark, right? Or and outside is purple because it's darker. <laughs> you know, I mean that's that's why I picked those colors. Um, and if you go back twenty years, fifteen or twenty years, there was a thing called a strip board, a production board. That's what made me and, think about it because it reminded me of a strip board. Yeah, my first two movies were uh, organized and planned using a strip board because uh, the computer software wasn't as great and it just wasn't the same. And, and it was a really great thing to do and you did it by hand and you had it up in the production office and it was really wonderful. And they had their strips, each strip that you would put on the board would represent the information of a scene, it would be the name, who's in it, the title, day or night, and they would have a color coordinated thing so that when you're going to make the schedule, you could say you're at the mansion and you're gonna shoot all afternoon outside, then you would put all those yellow scenes together in order. Um, and if you're gonna you know, shoot, uh, maybe, for instance, and I don't know if you guys knew this, but it, it never occurred to me <laughs> until about three or four films, there is no reason to shoot at night if you're filming inside. So an interior night scene can be filmed during the day. There is no reason to wait until 10 o'clock at night to film it. Um, so once I realized that, I never had an all night film shoot again. Um, it, it's just painful to put somebody through that because getting off the sleep pattern and then trying to get back on the sleep pattern the next day for, and you got one day off and then you got to get up at five o'clock in the morning again, you're going to be really messed up. So I tried to, if you're going to shoot a couple of night scenes, that's fine, but spread it out over a period of days so that, you know, you can still wrap by eight or nine o'clock at night or something. Um, but yeah, that's... You still color that's, code that as a night scene, even interior night. You still color code it that way if you were doing it, even though you yes. were shooting it per day. Yeah, and when you're, when you're organizing it, you, because let's say if interior blue represents interior night, I know that I can use any of the blue cards during the day. Because all we have to do is black out the windows and tarp up the outside. Okay. Um, but the purple ones would have to be after night. And then you'd have to look on the calendar when is sunset. Mm. You know, I mean, right now the sun is setting two hours differently than it is in another time of the year. So that's going to change your master plan based on your shooting dates. When is the sunrise and sunset? Um, so that all has to be taken into consideration. And at the and when you go to the, like my my example of the master plan at the top, I do have, um, you know, sunrise, sunset, uh, nearest hospital, you know, you have all the same information on it that you would normally have on a call sheet. It's just presented in a different way using the time of day. Okay. Um, does anybody have any other scheduling comments or questions? Great. Well, then, let's uh, hopefully I'll see you all on Saturday for the discussion of film festivals. We have another couple of really fun ones coming up. There's going to be one on selling your film. 
uh, where I talk about all of that. And yeah, um, for those of you who didn't hear me at the beginning, I have produced a radio drama of Ibsen's Head of Gobbler, which I released the trailer today on Spotify and um, the Zakango.com slash Head of Gobbler webpage. And then uh, the, the live, it's not a live radio show, but it's in the tradition of old time radio dramas that used to be, you know, like a movie for your ears. Uh, Head of Gobbler is going to go live. The release date is on Day of the Dead, November 1st. And I'll probably have it up by high noon Pacific time. Um, if not before, early that morning. Well, thank you very much for joining us all today. Um, and I look forward to more. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. See you guys. Bye. <laughs>